talking about variable capacitors, I can remember back in 1920 when a very uh, really unique variable capacitor. It consisted of a round ring of plastic material. At that time, I think they called that isinglass. I think that was the, the terminology for it, see? In other words, it was a hollow thing. It was about a quarter of an inch thick, and it had two isinglass plastic round things in front of it, and it was sealed. And then into which uh, he had one uh, a, a half a plate on one of these transparent pieces, and then he poured mercury in into the inside of it. So as you turned the plate, it the, the mercury. mercury moved around. Mercury was one one plate developed by a an outfit called Parkins, based in San Rafael. Really, a, oh, incidentally. Uh, the sister of the Parkin, I think, was considered to be the first woman commercial operator. But Parkin had a little manufacturing place in the back yard up there in San Rafael. And as a little kid, I used to go over there with my eyes bugging out. And, and uh, I finally got one of these things and, and brought it home and, uh, and played with it. I don't know that any good ever came of it. <laughs> Funny thing. Crosley also had what they called a, a book capacitor. That, that opened up like a book. Yeah, well, there, there were many variations, mechanical variations of uh, uh, capacitors. Rimmler made a very capacitor that there were sets of plates, multiple plates, but they worked on a on a, a gear. What you're talking about, and they, they came together. The plates the plates engaged each other as they as they came in like that. They worked on a gear a gear arrangement. So, you know, there are all kinds of variations during the broadcast area, from 22 to 28 and 30, there were all kinds of variations. And you, you can remember some of the beautiful Colin B. Kennedy stuff, mechanically just superlative. And Greeby. And there were others. And we, we haven't even touched headphones or loudspeakers, all of which, see, every one of these things interlocked. Headphones were an important part of these Back receivers. Days, the only headphones uh, to get were what they were they called the brownies. They had the mica diaphragm. Brandies. Brandies. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. See, because again, because there weren't amplifiers in this uh, uh, stage, you you had to have as much amplification in the earphones as you could get, and so therefore, highly sensitive designs of earphones were made. And later on, as the amplifiers came into being, well, then you had uh, all, all kinds of other types of earphones. You know, when you say, when you're talking about the development of receivers, you, you're taking a big, broad base. There's a lot of stuff involved in that. So whether or not this sort of thing would be interesting to anybody, I, I rather doubt it. You know, I've been there, so I yeah. saw all this stuff. But, uh, you know, who wants to know that? Well, I, I think there are people that, that want to know. People that collect now, I think, are get bored with having the hardware, yeah. and they want to know more about the intellectual evolution of what they have. Yeah. So I, I think there are people. Like but it's that. a broad base, see. You know, we probably missed out some other important phases of it. As I say, the loudspeaker industry, of course, developed as, by and large as an outgrowth of the broadcast. Obviously, the better. Remember the first phonographs? We had a horn on it, you know, and you wound them up to spring wine, and there was a big horn that, that came out, see? Well, if, if I read you right, it sounds like in a capitalistic society like the United States that a lot of the major evolutions in communications receiver design came from the broadcast industry or the marketing, uh, the production and well, I, generation of broadcast. I think so. I think that's true. But my question is, yeah. what about the companies that didn't care about the broadcast business, the people that, that focused on the communication stuff, like Hammerland, like RME, like Calicrafters, I guess, back in the beginning. Well, national, of course. And national. Well, national. But those people, they didn't care about the broadcast market. Well, they, they were... But yet, those are people that pioneered as well in the communications well, receivers. Well, see, now you've got to go back and, and look at something else. I think that most of the advancements or the suggestions for advancements could be laid at the doorstep of QST. See, even back to, way back in the Spark days, they came up with the 
antenna designs, which were highly, they were really technically sound. In other words, they were multi-wire types of things. There were cages that all were the right idea with a lot of capacity in order to uh, uh, get the frequency. QST, I think, for one, they were able to influence uh, most of the writers who, who started out as amateurs, by the way, and their heart, Krauss is an example, John Krauss, see? Well, their, some of their first materials were Roberto Silver. I'm sure wrote a lot of QST articles. See, John Krauss, probably one of the finest antenna experts, all wrote that, and then QST had all the articles. So, as I mentioned before, Jim Lamb was one of the first to develop this, this super hat. There were many other variations of receivers and transmitters. Transmitter design was going concurrently along with receivers. They were now beginning to realize that the self-excited oscillator was a thing of the past. First of all, improving the stability of the oscillator, which then, in the case of the oscillator, was a very large capacity and a small inductance. See, this was the way to stabilize the oscillator. But see, uh, then as we came into the oscillator stability, bear in mind now, the oscillator stability is dependent upon voltage variation. So see, we're entering, we're going to add another factor in here, and that's voltage regulation. These tubes then, they didn't have any voltage regulators. First rectifiers were not tubes but were selenium rectifiers. They were selenium disc type of thing. But but as they found out that the stability of the oscillator was dependent upon the voltage as well as other parameters, the voltage could change the oscillator frequency all over the lot. The, the need for voltage stabilizers came into it and so that these gas tubes that had a certain voltage that gas conducted and stayed relatively constant was in here, and so now you're uh, you're right into your solid state uh, voltage regulator. Do you remember the UX874? Not by name. It, it looked like a, like a big 80 type envelope, yeah. a, a bulb, but it had a, a plate, a round plate in it, and it was a gas filled tube. It looked like a 1920s version of an OD3. Well, there were many gas tubes on the thing. I can't. What were the first ones that you? Oh, no, I can't remember the name of it. There, were, there was one gas tube that was the first one, and then RCA came out later on with a whole, as you know, with a series of tubes: 50 volts, 75 volts, 100, 100 volts, 150 volts. It's a fairly constant drop. Those were much better than anything we had, but they weren't. They weren't anything like uh, the solid state. Voltage regulators that you have today, you know. We brought in another phase of voltage regulation. See, all of which went back essentially to oscillator stability. So the the first thing that they started out the need for was to keep the oscillator stable. Collins with his permeability tuning and sealing and the thing. Uh, then he had voltage regulators in those receivers too, but they were the, the primitive type. But they were voltage regulators. All the Collins receivers and transmitters have them in it, see? So it sounds like then that first Collins receiver laid out Stay all, of the, all of the intellectual groundwork, the foundations state, for the next 20 pretty years. Pretty much state of the art. Now, but bear in mind now that with the exception of the mechanical filter, uh, most of those things were borrowed from other uh, uh, technologies, you, the IF transformers, and things of that sort were But not, Collins was the first guy to put it all together into one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, not only that, but there were circuit parameters in there that were almost uh, the first as far as... See, they had some very good engineers in there.